So as you know, I'm Tammy the, from the ALS Society of Canada. Um, Lauren, who is joining me here today, is our Senior Manager of Stakeholder Relations and Advocacy. And what we wanted to talk to you about is the process that we've gone through and really the outcomes that have come from building relationships with government and how it's helped us to be able to move forward with um, a regulatory approval. And we think it's been very strong. So our mission at ALS Canada is around advocacy, making sure that we're supporting people who are living with ALS, investment in research, and more and more it's about uh, information and access to resources. When we think about how we do this across the country, if we start at the bottom, we're dealing with the reality that our uh, staff are right there from the day that somebody is diagnosed. In our province of Ontario, which is about a third of the population of people living with ALS in Canada, so we're very much knitted into our community and understand their day-to-day -day needs. And then as we look on a national or pan-Canadian perspective, we're doing a lot of other work. It's coming from the research side, it's the advocacy, the information and access to services. Um, increasingly, as we're doing some of the webinars and different pieces that everyone can access, and making sure that we're creating empowered advocates, and you're going to hear bit about that later. And then internationally, the work that we're doing as we are here today to be able to share information, advocacy, strategic partnerships. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, regulatory approval in Canada. And just to do a quick level setting, this is a quick view of the entire drug access processes in Canada. Health Canada uh, is the first step of many and is the agency in Canada that approves drugs. This can take about a year, 300 days to 180 days for this approval to come. So what I'm going to touch on now is some of the initiatives and programs that you can consider in forming relationships within your country, region, or area to move forward the needs of your community. At ALS Canada, first and foremost, our advocacy work is grounded in the experiences of our community. We work with the ALS community to inform our advocacy priorities and ensure that their voices and stories are reflected in all of our engagement with government. A key step in forming relationships to move forward your advocacy priorities is to explore the stakeholder landscape beyond those in government. Consider all those stakeholders who may play a role in the advocacy priorities that you are trying to move forward, especially access to therapies. For example, we engage with ALS companies developing therapies to understand what is required for them to bring their drug to Canada. We also look at other nonprofit organizations who may be advocating in the space of access to therapies to understand issues that affect us across Canada and not just within the ALS community. Clinicians, researchers, healthcare providers are key to advocacy work around access to therapies because Getting treatments is so integral to the work that they do in the care of people living with ALS. When the first, or the second drug I should say, came to Canada, 20 years after the first therapy was there, many within the ALS community had no institutional knowledge on how drugs become approved and available in Canada. So very quickly, our community had to learn this process and how we can advocate for expedited and equitable access to therapies for Canadians living with ALS. Since learning, this process more deeply, we have taken the time to share this information with our community and ensure that both organizationally and in the community, there is a level of subject matter expertise in the policies and processes around drug access in Canada. We also explore a coalition approach. As mentioned in that stakeholder map, there are many others who are also focused on the topic of access to therapies. And so it is key to us to find others in the ecosystem who align with our advocacy goals in increasing awareness of our message. And this may not always directly align, such as advocating for a specific therapy, but partnering with coalition partners who look at advocating for approval and access to therapies in general and how to reform those pathways is key to moving forward our message with a united voice. 
and industry partnerships. We want to make sure that we are building strategic partnerships with industry so that we can advocate for clinical trial access all the way through to market access. And this encourages companies to look at Canada as a first place market to bring their therapies. And also what's key to us is taking it from information to knowledge to wisdom. So how do we help inform, educate, and support efforts of our stakeholder community so that together we can work towards a goal of getting more therapies in Canada approved? And building on this is training well-informed and responsible community advocates, executing various different training sessions, educational programs to make sure that our community has those subject matter expertise and is prepared to answer questions around access to therapies. Very key, of course, is forming those government champions. So we have in Canada an all-party federal ALS caucus. This is a group of Canadian elected officials who have come together to support the issues related to ALS and access to therapies in Canada. We're able to leverage this group to form further relationships within government and further champions to support the issues of ALS. And what is absolutely key is that we engage our community in every single one of these interactions. We make sure that there is a face to what ALS looks like in Canada. And then most importantly is actually engaging directly with your health authority. And what's key to this is not just engaging with them when there is a drug for approval, but forming relationships that are long-standing and deeper and go beyond moments of approval. For example, here we see a picture of Supriya Sharma, who is the chief medical advisor in Canada, and we had invited her to attend a community training where she actually engaged directly with our community speaking about Health Canada. Opportunities like this provide health authorities a chance to form direct relationships with your community in and outside of drug approval. So I'm going to pass it back to Tammy to talk about our results. So that credible source of information is a really key part of it. It's making sure that people are understanding because in Canada, the drug approval might happen on a national basis, but access actually happens on a provincial basis, which ends up being that there's negotiations that happen in 10 provinces across the country, which a, a industry partner will tell you is much like negotiating with 10 different countries. So we want people to be very knowledgeable about what it is that's going forward. When we bring forward the community experience too, and what sets us apart, I think, is often making sure that people have a broad experience and understanding that ALS is heterogeneous, that it doesn't look the same for every person. And often if there's a one-to-one -one interaction with somebody that's not been able to present a broader perspective, it creates a very um, single dimension. And so we want to make sure that the very different ways that ALS can manifest is brought forward. And so that's a key part about what we are doing with it. Being a trusted partner to government is another piece. So we've been invited to participate in not just the pieces relating directly to ALS, but also more broadly on rare disease strategy, both at a healthcare level as well as when it does come to drug approval. And so this is us doing some of that type of work. Okay. And so as we saw, you know, this past year, we've been able to have two therapies move through the Health Canada approval process. That is really a massive ramping up from what we've seen in the past, but we were very pleased to be able to have this. Next piece is that we've been able to have um, our CADETH recommendations. So these are ways that the government looks to do reimbursement. And so the recommendations that were first put forward for the most recent therapy did not align well for our community. And I would suggest even still they don't, but at least we were able to make some changes that were reflected in the final recommendations. And it's because we are a trusted voice and we are able to provide quality input into these processes. And then the extension of personal importation. So again, when we had a therapy that was coming through personal importation coming out of Japan, 
the company, um, pardon me, the Health Canada would come to seek information from us about what was the community seeing? How would the impact be on direct community members? And so by becoming that trusted source, we were able to provide that two-way communication. So both understanding that they might be making changes, but also helping to inform how it would impact our community. And as a result, we were able to have this extended six times. The door is now closing on that, but it has been exceptional that we've been able to have that sort of relationship. And then Health Canada, for the first time ever, after much pressure, decided that they would entertain patient listening sessions into their processes. And ALS was selected as the first disease state to be, ever be part of this. And so we we're very pleased to be able to be there with a number of our community members as well. And I can tell you that the number of people from Health Canada far exceeded our number of people by um, probably four or five times, and so it was quite exceptional to have them listening so carefully. So. All right, so in summary, um, I'm gonna take a little beat on this. Uh, so four key things that have helped us grow this relationship with the regulatory authority in Canada to help us achieve all of these really strong results. So first and foremost, grounding advocacy in the experiences of your community, making sure that those voices are reflected in all the work that you do and wherever possible, making sure that they are present in the room and helping to inform your advocacy strategies. Second is building a relationship in an ecosystem of stakeholders. So who are those people beyond government who are going to have an impact and effect on access to therapies in your country? And how does their perspective help inform the work that you are doing? Creating a foundation of government champions is three, making sure that that foundation is in place to support your asks, whether it's related to access to therapies or not. This can be built through inviting them to events, having meetings, taking opportunities to engage with them both around your political asks, but also with just your community in general. And then fourth, regularly engaging the health authorities at different levels. So ensuring that you are connecting with them, not just in moments of regulatory approval when there's a drug in front of you, but taking the time to ensure that you are connecting them with your community and building that relationship outside of those opportunities. Finally, so that is it from us. Uh, here, our Q&A slide, if you will notice, is a picture of many of those within our community actually over a virtual advocacy week connecting with government officials. Thank you, Lauren. So do we have any questions? We have one virtual question. Okay, thank you. Um, it is from Lane Olaf, and he's asking, do you know the percentage of people in Canada that want to receive Albrioza and actually receiving it? No. I no, we don't have that number at this point. That was a simple answer yeah. but <laughs> to a complex problem. Yes, Lauren? I believe last year you talked a lot about um, you know, collaborations with other organizations and how each uh, organization had different levers to push, right? It's not, it's uh, you know, having trusted partners and different disruptors. I was really struck um, with your slide around wisdom. What does that mean? Um, in terms of what have you learned throughout this process? I know you just gave, but I was really struck by the word wisdom. What does that mean to you? Thank you. Um, I actually uh, looked to Dave about, about that particular piece that comes from information to knowledge to wisdom. And it's because so much in this is so much more complicated and complex than we had originally thought. And it is not an easy sound bite. And I think, you know, as a community, we were probably very naive when we came in. I know I certainly was thinking, oh, we're going to get a therapy. It's going to have a positive clinical trial and all people will get access. And that's not the reality. And so it takes time to understand what the process as it currently exists is, where the breaking points are that don't meet the needs of our community, where things can be influenced or not, where things should be influenced or not. And so it's coming to that place of wisdom. And it doesn't sell well as a soundbite, 
But the reality is, if you can, if you're pounding down the door and it's the wrong place, that's only aggravating somebody that should be your partner. Don't yell at Health Canada when the company hasn't even applied yet. And they may have already been doing outreach. And it then becomes a balance because we know a lot of information because we're working directly with the companies and we're working with Health Canada. And not all of it can also be visible. And so as much as you try to have that transparency and to demonstrate, you're also very cognizant of the relationships that you've built and what you're being able to share and have information on. It's like I said about Health Canada and personal importation. Definitely wasn't talking to the community every time Health Canada came and said, hey, what's the impact at this point? We just were working through the process with them. And so now a, a piece of it is making sure that our community can get to a place of wisdom because they may have information, but it's not necessarily knowledge yet, and we're working on helping to create that and then helping to get to the wisdom that we've learned over the past number of years of now working in this very complicated space. Tammy, uh, as everyone knows, I'm Canadian, so I'll pre-state my bias uh, before I ask this question, but I'm honestly not asking it from a Canadian perspective, it's from an organizational perspective. Advocacy is not the easiest sell or the sexiest thing to put into your budget and to convince your governance, uh, like your board of directors, to proactively do what you did. So can you cast your mind back to when you started this process um, which has really laid the foundation for your success now and how you um, drove that forward and um, how you convinced um, both your governors and your, you know, your, um, to include it in your budget and to really support advocacy um, in the way that you did. Thank you, Kathy. So it actually was the other way around. So the board was the one, when I showed you the mission statement, when we were first crafting that back in 2017, 2018, the board said, put, put advocacy into your mission statement. And I said, it's inherent in everything we do. We don't have fundraising in our, in our mission statement either. It's an enabler of all of the other pieces. And they drove it in there. And I said, OK. And it was very remarkable because as soon as you put a word like that in, you resource differently. And so at that point, Dave and I had been doing largely advocacy truly off the corner of our desk driving around the province. And through that process, we evolved and now we've got a team that work on advocacy and we, and we do resource it very differently. I think where the challenge then becomes is how do you sell that differently? Because we're a donor-funded organization and how do we get donors across the country to recognize the value of what it is that when we're advocating and helping to support so all Canadians get equitable and timely access to therapies and how this has a massive piece. It's easy to sell, easier to sell research, it's easier to sell community services in your, in your, in your place, but it's more difficult to sell the national need um, and the reason for support because it's not a, necessarily a hard cost, it becomes soft cost when you start to incorporate it into your operations. But it's critical, you cannot do this work without resourcing it because you will never get to that place of wisdom and you're going to just churn. You can't just use external resources, you have to have it embedded within your organization. So it's a very critical piece. Thank you, Kathy. And one last question because I still have to keep time, I can't allow myself an extra 12 minutes. <laughs> Um, Kevin Robinson asks, where do you see the friction points in collaboration, especially in the case with international partners, peers? I'll take that one as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, I think it's the reality that we all are working in different environments, regulatory environments, and I wouldn't call it friction so much as um, trying to find those points of commonality that I think make a difference. And even as we're working with the Canadian Organization for Rare Disease or other partners, different advocacy priorities, different nuance, you know, when we are working with the Canadian Organization for Rare Disease, they often tend to be more around pediatrics. And so how do we extend that out? When we are working with our international partners, even as we have at the advocacy committee, you know, when we're talking about therapies and you're dealing with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's pretty high up when, as Marcella reminds us on a regular basis, the very basics of what people need in Colombia are not being met. So how can we even think about therapies? And so how do we find those commonalities? Maybe set the stage for where we are going to go next and what principles need to be in place to be able to support everyone 
today, but for the future primarily.